Americans caught up in the daily routine of winter's coal and expressway traffic would like to forget the horror of war. But more in Vietnam, they would like to end the war. More than 10 years of battle halfway around the world has cost billions of American dollars and claimed well over 40,000 young American lives. But even the, the solemn statistics are not a true measure of war's unpopularity among American people. In the 60s, the generation of young people who came of age with the war was swept up in a romantic purge on the government to end all war. Peace now was the cry on the streets of virtually every major American city. Thousands marched, hundreds of miles, many in sandals or bare feet. But their efforts often evoke rage or fell on deaf ears. At the 1968 Democratic National Convention, Yippie met policemen in the streets of Chicago. America's young idealists had their dreams and their heads busted, while millions of Americans watched the unreal battle on television. In the fall of 1969, a million people marched to Washington to protest the war. The president relayed a message to the assembly that he had spent the afternoon watching a football game. Today, America faces a new protester, the Vietnam veteran. Many a Johnny who marched off to war found it contemptible and returned to say so. In Detroit, Michigan, the Organization of Vietnam Veterans Against the War gathered to recount to the American people the atrocities of the war. Having been a part of it, they dared to challenge the intentions, the operations, and the power of the American military. They disputed its honor when they tossed away their own combat medals. Unlike the thousands of protesters before them, these ex-servicemen had been to the Vietnam War. They reported as eyewitnesses on man's inhumanity to man. My testimony basically covers the maltreatment of prisoners, the suspects actually, and um, a convoy running down an old woman with no reason at all, no provocation or anything. And bounties were put on our own men and our own companies if they're inadequate in the field. Well, uh, we're going to allow everybody to speak first, and after that, the press will be allowed to ask questions. I was a helicopter pilot. I came out as a captain. I was in Vietnam with Marine Medium Helicopter Squadron 362 as a medevac pilot from August of 66 to September of 67. My testimony concerns the leveling of villages for, for no valid reason, throwing Viet Cong suspects from the aircraft after binding and gagging them with copper wire, and racism in the assignment of priorities to medical evacuations where white people were given priority over non-white people. My name is Scott Camille. I was a sergeant attached to Charlie 1-1. I was a forward observer in Vietnam. I went in right after high school, and I'm a student now. My testimony involves burning of villages with uh, civilians in them, the cutting off of ears, cutting off of heads, torturing of prisoners, calling in of artillery on villages for games, corpsmen killing wounded prisoners, napalm drop on villages, women being raped, women and children being massacred, CS gas used on people, animals slaughtered, Chu Hoi passes rejected and the people holding them shot, bodies shoved out of helicopters, tear gassing people for fun, and running civilian vehicles off the road. You witnessed a seven-year-old man wounded near uh, about 20 miles southwest of Da Nang. Could you elaborate on this, please? Uh, we went over there, and he was still alive. He was about 70 years old. He, he, I believe he was some sort of religious, like a monk or something like that, from his dress. He had an ID card, and he was in pretty bad shape, so they didn't want to call in a medevac chopper, so they told us to uh, kill him. And uh, the person who did the killing fired about six rounds in him, and uh, I had to tell him to stop. And uh, right after that, they called in. Uh, we told the lieutenant what the situation was. And he called in and said, uh, get rid of the, uh, he told us to get rid of the ID card before we killed him. And uh, he called in one BC body count. To let the people know how you treat the Vietnamese civilians. All right. Uh, the calling in of artillery for games, the way it was worked would be uh, the mortar 
forward observers would call in or we'd pick out certain houses in villages, friendly villages. And the mortar forward observers would call in mortars until they destroyed that house. And then the artillery forward observer would call in artillery until he destroyed another house. And whoever used the least amount of artillery, they won. And then when we got back, someone would have to buy someone else beers. And uh, the cutting off of heads on Operation Stone, uh, there was a lieutenant colonel there, and two people had their heads cut off and put on space and stuck in the middle of the field. And we were notified that there were press covering the operation and that we couldn't do that anymore. Uh, before we went out on the operation, we were told not to waste our heat tablets on food, but to save them for the villages because we were going to destroy all the villages. And we didn't give the people any time to get out of the villages. We just went in and burned them. And if people were in the villages yelling and screaming, we didn't help them. We just burned the houses as we went. Uh, wh why did you use uh, the heat tabs? Was, uh, did you just light off the villages with matches? Or did was, you plant the heat tabs, just throw the heat tabs in so it would keep burning? Uh, we throw the heat tabs in because it was quicker and they keep, they keep burning. They couldn't put the heat tabs out. We throw them on top of the, the houses. People uh, cut off ears, and when they'd come back in off of an operation, other people, you'd make deals before you'd go out. And like, for every ear you cut off, someone would buy you two beers. So people cut off ears. Uh, the torturing of prisoners was done uh, with beatings. And uh, I saw one case where there were two prisoners, and one prisoner was uh, staked out on the ground, and he was cut open while he was alive and part of his insides were cutting out, and they told the other prisoner if he didn't tell them what they wanted to know that they would kill him. And I don't know what he said because he spoke in Vietnamese, but then they killed him after that anyway. Uh, right, uh, were these uh, primarily civilians, or do you believe that they were, uh, or do you know that they were actual... Uh, um, the way that NBA. we distinguish between uh, civilians and VC, uh, VC had weapons and civilians didn't, and anybody that was dead was considered a VC. If you killed someone, they said, how do you know he's a VC? You would, the general reply would be, he's dead. And that was sufficient. Uh, women, when we went through the villages and searched people, uh, the women would have all their clothes taken off, and the men would uh, use their penises to probe them to make sure they didn't have anything hidden anywhere. And uh, this was raping, but it was done as searching. As, uh, as searching. Were there uh, officers present there? Or? Yes, there were. Uh, was this on, on a company level? Or company level. The company commander was around when this right. happened. Did he approve of it, or did he look the other way? or? He never said not to, or never said anything about it. But the main thing was, if an operation was covered by the press, there were certain things we weren't supposed to do. But if there was no press there, it was okay. The carefully monitored news released to the American press about the Vietnam War lays the foundation for suspicious reporters at home. At the hearings in Detroit, one reporter said his newspaper would want credentials from those who testified to support their statements. We uh, have a quiet place so everyone can hear the question. The question or the remark was made of the credibility of these Marines. The names, serial numbers, background will be made available on all witnesses. Uh, I saw one case where a woman was shot by a sniper, one of our snipers. And when we got up to her, she was asking for water. And uh, the lieutenant said to kill her. So they ripped off her clothes. They stabbed her in both breasts. They spread her eagle and shoved an e-tool up her vagina in a trenching tool. And uh, she was still asking for water. And then they took that out and they used a tree limb. And then she was shot. Okay. Uh, what was did the men in the uh, in, in your outfit or the, when when you witnessed these uh, things? Did they? Seem to think that the uh, it was all right to do anything to the Vietnamese. Uh, where, did they? Uh, it wasn't like they were humans. Like we were, you know, we were conditioned to believe that you know this was for the the good of the nation, the good of our country, and that anything we did was okay. And like when you shot someone, you didn't think you were shooting a human. They were a gook or a commie, and it was okay. And anything you did to them was okay because like they they would tell you, well, they would do it to you if they had the chance. While Americans listened in shock at the testimony they heard inside, right-wing groups protested in 20-degree temperature and blowing snow outside. Donald Lobsinger, whose Detroit breakthrough group of patriots 
have countered many a leftist statement in the street, was joined by the Edmund Burke Society from Toronto, Canada. Carrying American and Canadian flags and placards with win the war sentiments, the protesters generally discounted what was happening inside as communist inspired. <laughs> I think that I've made my point. Our purpose here today is to demonstrate that Americans are willing to resist. They are not going to give in to these efforts to break down their will to resist communism. How many organizations are represented by your group here? Breakthrough is represented here today, and we're expecting in any minute of members of the Edmund Burke Society from Toronto, Canada. They're here? Okay. The Edmund Burke Society. Is, are you including? Um, yes. Are you including Emil Maisie in your uh, comments here today? Do you feel that he's a traitor to the United States? I very definitely consider Emil Maisie, Emil Maisie, a traitor to the United States, and I consider Richard Austin a traitor to the United States. They are lending their names and the prestige of their office and the organization to a communist front activity, and to that extent. They are traitors to the United States, and they not only should be thrown out of their offices, but they should be jailed and treated as such. How do you feel you should be delivered? The next speaker, the testifier, is James McKay, um, former E5. James? My name is James. My name is James McKay. I served with... Uh, Headquarters 3rd Brigade of the 9th Division from October 68 to August 69, and then I served with the 1st Cav from August 70 to December 70. Uh, during this time, our helicopters, our Cobra gunships, and a small observation helicopters would go out on search and destroy missions, more or less, where they'd go out and they'd shoot anything, any structures they saw. They'd shoot all structures, and they'd shoot all people, be they men, women, or children. Many anti-war sympathizers were disturbed that customs officials had allowed the Toronto group to cross the border. A group of Vietnamese citizens who were scheduled to testify at the hearings via closed circuit TV from Windsor were not granted visas into Canada. Those attending the hearings viewed the border incidents as backroom international politics. Before the end of the three-day hearings, however, some Vietnamese citizens were allowed into Canada, and a portion of the testimony was taken at the University of Windsor. When they fired on un on any moving target, that meant men, women, and children. Uh, one kind of joke that went between the pilots was if they fired or not upon anybody they saw was whether they waved or not. This is a kind of a joke going between the pilots, but it didn't count because they just shot anything they saw. When you interrogate a POW or a villager, what to look for, where they hide things, and they stress over and over again that a woman, a woman has more um, available places to hide things like uh, maps or anything than a male. So it w we, we covered about 20 minutes on where to search for objects for a male suspect and about an hour on a female because it was like everyone was getting into it pretty heavy like, you know, you know, wishful thinking, you know. In the hallways and the hotel lobby outside the hearing room, Hippies and ex-GIs met in informal anti-war caucuses. The GIs were particularly disturbed and considered a formal action when it was rumored that a U.S. invasion of Laos was pending. Many of the organizers of the hearings met in concern over the lack of attention paid the hearings by the national press. Even the appearance of Jane Fonda and Mark Lane did not attract much attention. Although the veterans were the new blood in the movement, their views concerning what's wrong with America matched many a leftist hippie before them. Since the first head was cracked by a policeman's stick, leftists across the country have blamed policemen's extreme hostility and seemingly indiscriminate use of their clubs on suppressed sexuality in America. A GI who commented briefly in the hall between meetings tied many of the atrocities in Vietnam to the same sexual root. We have no way to release our inner tension. And the easiest uh, method, the easiest way to do this is to use the, the, the weapon, which is a phallic symbol, against the people. Um, this also has a lot to do with racism. And sexual frustration. 
people in this country, in this culture, have not learned to deal with themselves, have not learned to deal with their own bodies and how to relate to themselves, you know, in a normal, natural uh, manner. If you can't deal with yourself and being about loving yourself, you just can't be about loving anybody else. Uh, every time you come across a situation where you run into somebody whose physical appearance differs than yours, your mind manifests this, uh, this perversion that you've been taught. And uh, you move on as it's uh, the person who you're now dealing with because they don't look exactly like you. Into a trench full of civilians, which I thought he would have said, I, you know, I, my moral indignation would have been too much. He said I probably would have shot into him. He's because the whole set's over there. It's a matter of survival. You really can't tell who the enemy is, and it's you know they're just so filled. I don't know if they've been bringing that out. They're just so filled with stories with of uh, women baby, booby trapping their babies. By the second and third days, news of the hearings had reached local hippies and street people, and they took up daily residence. Although they were concerned at the testimony, most had read it before in underground newspapers or heard it before at other anti-war rallies. Some admitted that while the war was wrong and something should be done to stop it, they attended the hearings because there was little else to do in the streets in the wintertime. For most, demonstrations were old hat, a place to see friends, a social as well as political event. They usually slipped out of the hearings a few hours a day for a short nap in the hallway, or a quick snack from the hotel restaurant. Generally, they found the hotel as friendly a place as any to get in out of the cold. Obviously, there are about 700 people in there. Mr. Bishop, you've uh, uh, stated in your testimony that you uh, witnessed your commanding officer killing a prisoner. Could you go into that a little bit, please? Uh, we had just gone on a search and destroy mission in the mountains, and uh, we made no contact. We were on our way back, and we knew of, the, uh, we knew of enemy in the area. And we were, there was a lot of rock formations where we were, and we were checking out the bunkers and the holes and everything in the rocks. And uh, we came across a wounded prisoner who was uh, a wounded uh, Vietnamese. And... Um, he appeared to be he appeared to be either VC or NVA. He didn't have a weapon. There were a few grenades and rounds laying around him. He seemed to be in this hole for quite a few days. One of his legs was broken in half, and um, the maggots had already gotten into one of his legs, and they were living inside of his leg while he was still alive. Well, we dragged him out, and we had quite a bit of we had uh, quite a distance to go down the mountain to get back to the base camp, and um, the squad that found him had to uh, report him to the skipper. So the skipper. Uh, came down to where they had found the prisoner, had asked the uh, people around him to get going and that he would tend to the prisoner. And uh, I was a machine gunner at the time and I had to set up some security around him. And uh, I came up over uh, a rock to watch what he was doing and um, he took out his 45 and uh, he blew his head off. I was picked up by a truckload of grunt marines with two company grade officers, first lieutenants. We were about five miles down the road where there were some Vietnamese children uh, at the gateway of the village, and they gave the old finger gesture, gesture at us. Uh, and uh, it was uh, understandable that they picked us up from the GIs there. They stopped the truck. Well, they didn't stop the truck. They slowed down a little bit, and it was just like response. The guys got up, including the lieutenants, and just blew all the kids away. There was about five or six kids blown away there, and then the truck just moved uh, continued down the hill. That was my first day in Vietnam. Yeah, but they found a woman with bandages. So she was questioned with about, she was questioned by six Arvins and the way they questioned her was since she had bandages, uh, they, sh they shot her. She was hit about 20 times. So after she was questioned, uh, of course dead, uh, this guy come over who was, and knowing him, uh, he was a former major. He was in the service for 20 years and he, he got hungry again and came back over working with uh, USAID, <laughs> Aid International Development. And uh, he uh, went over there and 
ripped her clothes off and took a knife and cut from her vagina all the way up, well, just about up to her breast and organs out. Thank you very much, uh, Doug. Uh, our next testimony will come from Mr. Art Kanagas. The information we'll be discussing is with reference to automated battlefield equipment, electronic equipment for detection and... <laughs> She went to the north when she was four months pregnant and the child was born there. This was her first child. The child has one line across the palm, has a small head and shows symptoms of having no cerebrum. The child convulses with legs crossed and head tilted backwards. The hard palate of the mouth is much higher than normal. There are lesions in the uh, respiratory system. Uh, when the child breathes, the neck immediately above the chest collapses inward. The child can only eat, defecate, and urinate. Those effects of being a typical mongoloid, the eyelids have an extra wrinkle typical of mongoloidism, and there's only one cross line across the palm. Uh, feet and hands can both be bent back in the wrong direction, and the heels can easily be made to touch the ear. The child cannot walk or talk, except to say, Mama. The mother is Wang Ti Li, 37 years old, Quang Tri Province, Camlo Village. The mother had two previous children, 15 years of age and 17 years of age. Both are normal. Mother was hit directly with chemical spray when seven weeks pregnant. The child was born in North Vietnam. The child's head, head is flat from behind with a prominent forehead. Index finger is flat, three toes are abnormally long. Uh, the left foot has six toes. Tear ducts, instead of running out onto the eyes, run down into the nose, causing choking. Uh, when the child cries, the tears run into the nose cavity and back into the, to the uh, throat. And it also causes permanent infection of the eyes. Uh, the child can neither stand nor walk, has very low intelligence, can cry but cannot talk. The echo Mark Twain's indictment of the war crimes committed during the Philippine insurrection. We have invited our clean young men to shoulder a discredited musket and do bandits' work under a flag which bandits have been accustomed to fear, not to follow. We cannot conceal from ourselves that privately we are a little troubled about our uniform. Prides, it is acquainted with honor. It is familiar with great deeds and noble. We love it, we revere it. And so this errand that is on makes us uneasy. And our flag, another pride of ours, the chiefest. We have worshipped it so, and when we have seen it in far lands, glimpsing it unexpectedly in that strange sky, waving its welcome and benediction to us, we have caught our breaths and uncovered our heads for a moment. For the thought of what it was to us and the great ideals it stood for. <laughs> 